So thanks for the invitation to come and speak. Um, so I'll just talk very briefly about some work we've recently commenced looking at uh, rice grain storage protein composition, rice grain quality, and the extent to which there is or is not a link between composition and uh, quality. So first what I'll do is I'll just provide a little bit of background context in terms of sort of the work, the area in which I, w I work in, and then just uh, the work itself. Um, so. Really, this is sort of the domain in which I've been working over the years, mainly, so I've had links with the Australian rice industry and links with the uh, breeding program, uh, which is in the south of the country here in Australia. And um, so it's really, it's been about providing um, molecular markers in large part for their uh, breeding program in the context of quality. So really, I just throw this slide up here just as sort of an introduction, sort of the, the idea, the environment in which, sort of the domain in which we've been operating. So as you know, genotype by environment interactions result in this very complex thing called quality, while on the other side we have the humans, our own genotype, and probably more importantly, our sort of cultural background and so on that actually feeds into what we perceive or the, um, the rice breeding, the rice consuming community, which is, as we all know, quite large, um, their perception of uh, what is quality. So we have that, it's really reasonably complex sort of environment in which to operate. And so in terms of where things have uh, gone over the time in which I've been working in rice, in rice uh, molecular genetics and breeding and so on, and quality over the last, what is the, getting on to 12, 14 years or so, um, when I, I've been in the fortunate position where I, when I started working with rice, the rice genome sequence was just released. And so um, I've had this, been in a luxurious position where I've always had a rice genome sequence with which to work when I've um, been developing markers and uh, doing molecular genetics. And if, as we know, things have advanced now to the point where, uh, where we can... Um, a single platform here is capable of basically fulfilling all our genotyping needs, the whole genome sequence. You can tweak that and push it in particular directions for particular purposes. However, on this particular side here, when it comes to the phenotyping, breaking down the components of what is uh, rice quality, little has changed over the last 14 years. There's still a number of different instrumental measures that are used trying to actually break this apart, break down what is rice quality. And so it's still, in this area here, there's still a fair bit of work to be done. This side of the, op of the equation is, in many ways, it's not quite trivial, but it's sort of ver bordering on the trivial in the extent to which we can actually capture whole genome sequence and uh, get that data. Really where the challenges lie is this phenotyping, trait dissection and understanding the different components of the, uh, the traits. And then just quickly, when it comes to marker-assisted selection in this background, in this context. I refer, I'm just referring here to a slide which I saw in 2005. I was so impressed by the talk that I got Dave McKeel to send me the slide and so this is Dave's slide at the time describing what um, uh, marker assisted background and crossing and this is in part what I, where I see the uh, rice quality um, research where I think it can make a real contribution to breeding and I think I may have even mentioned um, uh, food security in my abstract, and I put this here in part because I just a little description of what I can see where quality makes a contribution in that context. So this is classic marker-assisted back crossing is just where you have the, uh, the target gene, you have a, tar a target gene here. You can actually narrow this by having recombinant selection, and equally you can background selection, then you can extend the... Um, the extent to which you can pick up the re background recurrent parent by picking up the background. The reason why Dave was particularly interested in and presented this work at the time was because they had the sub-1 gene, which is a gene for submergence tolerance, abiotic stress tolerance. They'd inserted that, they'd cloned, they'd identified the gene, they'd integrated that into particular backgrounds, and they had submergent tolerant um, varieties which, so which could co cope with the abiotic stress tolerance of being submerged underwater. But the problem they confronted was the quality was not appropriate and they struggled to get the appropriate quality. So what they had to do was they engage in this background selection to get back 
to the high quality rice background with their submergence tolerance gene in it. And so I guess really what I'm thinking here is by understanding rice quality, understanding the genes which control that quality, which is reasonably fixed in terms of it doesn't really change between communities, Really, well, the thing that will be changing is the abiotic, and not so much abiotic, but certainly biotic stress tolerances you need to breed for. So you need to keep disturbing that genetic background. And so if we understand the genes which control this uh, quality, we'll then be able to um, more accurately and quickly get back to high quality backgrounds. And it's important to be able to breed for high quality rice because it's not sufficient simply to have a particular variety which has a particular abiotic stress tolerance if the quality is not appropriate because simply it's, you'll only wind up with a couple of uh, tonnes of seed whereas really to actually get the seed, the seed increase so you'll actually have your um, genes deployed across the landscape at the appropriate level uh, you will need to actually have um, grain quality or uh, have, have an appropriate quality in, that, in those varieties. Anyway, that's a bit of the background. So moving more to the work that we've been engaging in the context of uh, protein. Um, so this is just a quick outline of where we're operating. So uh, the rice, rice grain is primarily starch, around up from sort of 5 to 10 percent protein, around about 1 percent lipids here, which Ben will talk about, and these uh, secondary metabolites, which equally, although very small, are also very important in terms of the impact they have on quality. So, just really moving down that list. Firstly, starch. So, there's been a fair bit of work done in starch over the years. Um, and really, essentially, what all this work has found in that time is that there's two primary controllers of starch quality in um, rice. So, granule-bound starch synthase over here, which controls amylose content, and then soluble starch synthase 2A, which controls amylopectin structure and also which then and these are the two primary genes which feed into um, rice quality. There's a couple of other genes here in the start synthase family. This is work that we did at Southern Cross some years ago. Um, a couple of other genes in this list that also play a role. This, this branching enzyme here may also play a role or, uh, although it is actually on chromosome 7 along with these two so it's a bit uncertain at this stage the extent to which it plays a role. So. The, the, the point of it is, is that there's about 18 different genes and two of these control quality. So a number of different work, uh, uh, um, pieces of work have come back to these, this little collection of genes. And so in many ways, this frame of reference, which is now well understood, which allows us then to move to the next level, I guess, which is rice grain protein. So prior, prior to really fully understanding what was going on in the context of starch and the impact it had on quality, it's very hard to ascertain the impact of proteins. It really comes down to that trait definition question again. If the, if the, if the starch uh, is varying across your, um, in your experiments, but you're not fully aware of the impact of starch on the different instrumental measures of quality and so on, it's very hard to actually um, understand what the role that protein plays. However, now that we understand the role that protein, uh, starch plays, sorry, it allows us to ha have a closer look at proteins and the extent to which they may um, explain some of the variation in quality that is yet to be explained, which I must point out at this stage is um, secondary to starch, but there is starch does not complain, explain all the variation. So if you were to look at a starch grain, uh, sorry, a rice grain, break it apart, you can, see, you can see here there's these protein bodies, so these little rounds um, things here, that's the protein in here, and this is the starch granule. So you can actually see them. And then if you stain them here again, there's two different types. Protein bodies 2, protein body 1, these are the glutellins. And they're uh, defined by their solubility differences, which are important in the extent that uh, at least there's a reasonable possibility, because they're widely differing in solubility, that they'll have an impact on rice eating quality. Um, so the glutellins are soluble in acid and um, dilute, in dilute acid and alkali, while the globulins are salt soluble. And these prolamins here, which are around about 20% of the total, are alcohol soluble. 
The point being is that these solubility differences are the means by which they're defined. Um, of the Perlman genes, they're around about 24. So once again, we can scan through the genome, have a look to see what's, um, how many there may be there. This is work done a couple of years ago um, where they are looking at um, Perlman's as, a, uh, as much as anything as a model for protein biosynthesis. However, of these 34, only a small, only a, I think it's around about 20, 20 odd are actually full length without stops and so on. And so they're only about 20, yeah, around about 20 of those are actually full length, appear to be functional genes. Likewise, with the glutelins, um, there's only about 12 of those. So in combination, although there may be, there's only about 30 odd protein, structural genes for these protein bodies in combination with a single globulin. So there's only about 30 different structural genes. And so at most, then if, if starch and if it's the structural genes that control, um, have an impact, there's not that many. So in terms of the total number of markers you might be looking at, it would only be 30 odd to get. But however, it's, if it's less than that, if it's at some higher order control like transcription factor or so on, it'll reduce it even more. So there's really not potentially not that many genes which are controlling it. And so in the context of the quality, um, we, uh, moving back to the quality, it's known that um, quality actually does influence um, cooking quality. So this is some work that was done years ago by um, Melissa Fitzgerald with uh, Margaret Martin at, in when they were uh, at the rice breeding. Um, at the, in, as part of the rice breeding program in southern New South Wales. What we're looking at here, these are RVA curves, which I'll... Ex so essentially, the top curve is with, with the protein included. You put protein, uh, protease in, and it changes the shape of this viscosity curve. And it's different depending on the level of amylose content. So that's the critical thing really here is that by taking the protein out, it does actually have a significant impact on these, this instrumental measure of, um, of quality and, and it differs between the, uh, the level of amylose content but moving on to the, uh, the work that we're doing um, so analysing storage proteins in what we're looking at now a paper was re just recently um, looked at the different options in the context of rice breeding I mean there's a number of different ways of looking at um, analysing these proteins We've chosen this one here because it's based on solubility differences, so reverse phase HPLC. And so once again, solubility, mouthfeel, that sort of thing is more likely to have an impact on, to be, have a measurable impact rather than just size alone. So in my view, I think at least it's more likely to be related to eating quality. And just very quickly, for those not familiar, essentially it's a reverse phase HPLC separates on the basis of solubility, the extent to which they, the, um, the molecule you're analysing adheres is retarded in the column. So you've got these little fatty uh, carbon chains off the end of this matrix in your column and the, your analytes are um, retained on the column, depending on the level of solubility. So the more uh, water-soluble compounds tend to move more, through more quickly. And as it happens, years ago, before um, back in the 90s, um, Proteins are actually used to discriminate between different rice varieties. This is before we had uh, good quality DNA um, fingerprinting and so on. So the work was already out there um, showing that you can actually, there are varietal differences you can measure using HPLC. So we just simply picked up that particular, those particular papers and had a look see in a small set of germplasm, only 20 uh, different varieties that were available at the time. And, um, separated these uh, proteins out of rice grains. And this is essentially what a trace looks like here. As the acetonitrile concentration increases across the course of this um, profile, so you have the more um, water-soluble proteins here at the start and the more um, fat-soluble towards the end. And then this is just the rice varieties here that we looked at and just a hierarchical cluster. You actually can separate these. There's quite clear differences into three different groups. And then really, but of course, we need to do more than just simply repeat the work and um, 
fingerprint these things and show the uh, varietal relationships or the relationship between these varieties. And so by taking some of these, the, the actual structure of this cluster changes as you include more data. So putting in the grain quality data and also having a look at some of these peaks, they actually were correlated with um, a couple of instrumental measures of quality, setback and maximum load. Um, I'll describe setback shortly, but maximum load is a means by which you measure the um, resistance to um, resistance to a um, penetration of a gel. And so the higher the number, the more resistance is, the harder the starch. And getting to setback, just to set back, this one here is, that's the, so this is the RVA curve again, this is the peak. So the temperature increases, so you have time here, viscosity measured here, and the temperature of the gel rises and then falls, and the viscosity changes over time. This is what's measured here, is set back. You can see here, this is just a group of different uh, um, species in this case and varieties. The outliers are the cultivated. These are actually wild rices. That's a different story which I shouldn't go into, but in fact I have nothing like the time to do it. So just, get, just quickly looking at this. So um, <coughs> in this very small set of germplasm, we've only got 20 odd different uh, samples here. And so if you look at amylase content, which in this uh, sample set varied by around about um, I think it was 3.5%, so it's not a huge level of variation. Nevertheless, amylase content still explains a reasonable proportion of the RVA, that instrumental measure of quality RVA setback. And total protein also controls some of that trait. But if you look at some of these individual peaks, so actually pull those peaks out and then correlated those with these, they are also individual peaks are explaining some of this um, of the setback as well. So this is, um, I guess, promising, uh, and keeping in mind that there is the amylase content is varying in that um, particular set of germplasm, and this is the maximum load. So amylase content explaining a reasonable proportion. Likewise, Pradelman Peak Nine and total protein however, is explaining very little at all. So I guess the important thing here is that amylase content and this peak here seem to be explaining a reasonable proportion of the um, variation in that uh, particular trait. So I've all, I guess when it also something else that needs to be pointed out or, or mentioned in this context is it's where actually it's a correlation between a trait which is correlated. So I mean the extent to which this explains eating quality, there's still that uncertainty in this um, particular piece of work and I guess it's the same for most pieces of work in quality. The ultimate test will be um, eating quality and just the re concluding remark is as I say it's preliminary, it's going to be extended so that was only 20 odd samples so now now that they are available from the breeding program we're going to have a look in probably uh, oh, well, we've got I don't know, four or five hundred different ones but we'll just go through that and identify those um, sets of germplasm so we can get about 100 um, different lines which fall within a single 1% um, variation in amylose and, if, and in, those, in that set amylose is any variation in amylose is not explaining any of the variation in setback or maximum load so what we'll now do is go through with what is now an improved HPLC um, protocol and then pick out some of these peaks and see if them, how much of the trait they explain. And I'll very quickly acknowledge RIRDC, New South Wales DPI, and Jeanette, who's student working on it, Ben here, and the people at New South Wales DPI, Rochelle, Laura, Margaret and Peter.